uh, anup sir uh, can you hear me now yes sir uh, can you see my screen uh, yes sir we can see your screen okay Good morning, all. Uh, uh, my morning, name. Sir. Sorry. Sir, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Good morning, all of you. Okay, I am Dr. Anup Basak. I'm uh, assistant professor at IIT Tirupati. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Government College of Engineering Kalahandi for giving me this opportunity. Okay, so my talk will be uh, on phase field modeling of martensitic phase transformation. This is uh, one of my research topics. Okay, so what is phase transformation? Uh, that I'll uh, show in this slide first. Uh, before that, I'd like to recapitulate what do we mean by phase that we usually study in thermodynamics. Phase is nothing but a chemically homogeneous part of a system, which is physically distinct from the other part of the system. Uh, and transform phase transformation, what do you mean by phase transformation? This is nothing but transformation from one phase into another phase. Now, I'll give some examples. This is what we see in our daily life. Uh, for example, we see that melting of ice into water or freezing of water into ice or a vaporization of uh, water into water vapor. So these are all phase transformation that we observe in our day-to-day -day life. Now, there are several kind of phase transformation, uh, the several uh, kind of classification of phase transformation. So I'll consider here one of the classifications uh, which is uh, relevant for this talk. But uh, I would like to mention that phase transformation is a topic which is uh, studied by several disciplines, including physics, chemistry, mathematics, material science, mechanical engineers, chemical engineers. And everyone actually looks at this topic from different perspectives. This is one of the perspective which is usually uh, 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 looked uh, at it by researchers from material science and mechanics uh, community. Uh, now, coming, to, coming back to this classification of phase transformation, I would like to classify this phase transformation into uh, two uh, categories. One is phase transformation with change in state of aggregation. For example, liquid, uh, sorry, melt, solid, or gas, these are different state of aggregation. And there is, uh, there is a possibility of transformation from one state of aggregation, for example, solid to melt. This is one kind of phase transformation. Another kind of phase transformation could be a uh, transformation without change in state of aggregation. For example, both the phases are in solid, solid state. So this is one uh, category of transformation. And in material science, being mechanical engineers or material scientists, we usually see this kind of examples. For example, uh, pure iron, where uh, delta iron, which is BCC, if it is cooled down at 1392 degrees centigrade, it becomes gamma iron, which is FCC, phase centered cubic crystal, right? And then if it is further cooled down to 911 degrees centigrade, it usually transforms to alpha iron, which is again BCC crystal structure. So here there is no change in state of aggregation. All the phases are in solid. So this is another kind of phase transformation. Another example of uh, this kind of phase transformation could be paramagnetic to ferromagnetic phase transformation. Uh, if it is cooled down to below uh, Curie temperature, then uh, sorry, yeah, uh, this paramagnet, it becomes ferromagnet. So these are different examples. And there, were, there are several other classification of phase transformations. We are not going to get into that uh, because this is our main focus. And here you should note that the solid to solid phase transformation, there is a change in crystal structure. This is very important. This is uh, uh, called martensitic phase transformation. And there is no diffusion of atoms involved here. Okay, so this is a, a brief introduction to phase transformation, which is recapitulation of what we studied in undergraduate. Okay, so before uh, going to the phase field modeling of martensitic phase transformation, let us just try to understand what do we mean by phase field modeling from the perspective of solid melt phase transformation because this is one of the simplest transformation and we are all we all are familiar with this transformation and here we'll consider a theory of phase transformation which was given by Landau uh, a very famous physicist uh, Nobel laureate Leib Landau okay he the way he described the phase transformation is by introducing a function a scalar function which is called order parameter 
And his idea was that, for example, let us consider a, a melt, which is let's say disordered. Here, all the atoms are disordered. That is what we know from physics. And let's say the same uh, material, for example, let's say aluminum, when it is solidifies, solidified, it is completely crystal. Okay, so this is here we see that all the atoms are completely ordered and here all the atoms are completely disordered. So he described this transformation as order disorder transformation, where uh, he assumed a scalar uh, parameter called order parameter, which was assigned to be zero when it was fully disordered. That means, for example, melt and it was assigned equal to one when it is fully ordered, let's say uh, when it is solid. Okay. And the he the way he described this transformation from order to disorder or order uh, disorder to order transformation is through a continuous process so he uh, assumed that this process of order to disorder transformation is not discontinuous it does not happen suddenly so this bunch of these disordered atoms it uh, gradually it becomes ordered so he assumed this order parameter a continuous function which varies from zero to one but this variation occurs through a continuum process. It's a, it's a continuous process. Okay, so this is the idea of phase transformation theory by Landau. Okay, and we'll here adopt this theory by Landau for describing the martensitic phase transformation also. This is quite famous theory, uh, uh, started uh, back several uh, decades back, for example, some uh, in 50s or 60s, I think. It became quite popular. Uh, now, from thermodynamics, we know that this phase transformation is usually described by Gibbs free energy. So here is a uh, usual uh, uh, plot for Gibbs free energy that is uh, usually uh, described in describing this phase transformation. Okay, so here we have a plot for enthalpy, and we remember that Gibbs free energy is nothing but enthalpy minus temperature times entropy. So this is the definition from uh, thermodynamics. Okay, so here is the enthalpy plot for melt phase and here is the enthalpy plot for solid phase which can be obtained uh, by uh, using uh, the specific heat at constant pressure. Okay, here I didn't give the expression but that is how it is usually calculated. And here we see that uh, below this and this is this temperature is corresponding to the melting temperature. Okay, below this melting temperature this solid phase, which is usually stable, okay? And above the melting temperature, it is the melt phase, which is stable. And when it, solid, uh, when it melts uh, from solid to melt at melting temperature, there is a jump in uh, enthalpy, and that is called the heat of fusion, or latent heat, okay? When we plot the Gibbs free energy using this information, we see that this is the plot for Gibbs free energy of the solid phase. Okay, below the melting temperature, this is uh, this uh, uh, solid curve is the Gibbs free energy corresponding to the solid phase, and after the melting temperature, it is th this dotted curve is extension of this. Okay, and okay, and above the melting temperature, this is the melt phase which is not stable sorry, below the melting temperature. Uh, this is the melt phase, which is not stable and it is shown through this dotted line and above the melting temperature, it is the melt phase, which is stable uh, and it is shown by the solid curves. And at melting temperature, we see that there is a discontinuity in slope of the Gibbs free energy. Discontinuity in slope of the Gibbs free energy and this is the reason it is called first order phase transformation because here it is the first derivative of Gibbs free energy, which is discontinuous whereas the Gibbs free energy is continuous, okay? So this is uh, the description of the uh, thermodynamic description of solid to melt transformation, okay? And in phase field model, we translate this uh, picture through, uh, through introduction of this Gibbs free energy of this kind, where we assume that Gibbs free energy, it consists of, okay, this is the Gibbs free energy of the entire system and GM is nothing but Gibbs free energy of the melt. And this is the barrier energy. I'll uh, uh, shortly describe what they mean by this barrier energy. And this is the thermal energy, which is uh, involved in this phase transformation. Okay, so for example, let us consider this rate curve. Rate curve is 
uh, the curve of the Gibbs free energy corresponding to the melting temperature. And here we see that Gibbs free energy corresponding to the melting temperature, this is, uh, this is same. But here we should remember that when there is a mixture of solid and melt, okay, the Gibbs free, there is a barrier height, there is an energy barrier involved for transformation from melt to solid or solid to melt. Okay, so that barrier height is this height. So this is a double well potential, a double well uh, potential corresponding to the, to the Gibbs free energy. Okay, and this is corresponding to the melting temperature. And here, this is Gibbs free energy versus order parameter. I already described what do I mean by order parameter. Okay, uh, and we assume that eta equal to zero corresponds to the melt phase and eta equal to one corresponds to the solid phase. Okay, so here this well or this minima, local minima in the Gibbs free energy it corresponds to the solid phase and this local free energy, uh, local minima corresponding to the free energy it corresponds to the melt phase. Okay, and here we see that although this height or depth of these two wells are equal at the melting temperature, but there is an energy barrier that is involved here. So solid or melt uh, spontaneously cannot transform to each other okay because of this energy barrier and this energy barrier is basically this term okay, in the phase field model okay and uh, of course why it is eta square one minus one minus eta square this is uh, derived using certain polynomial of certain degrees okay and there are certain other conditions that are uh, imposed on these polynomials uh, i am not going to describe all these things in details but this is how it looks like the gibbs free energy Okay, now this is corresponding to the melting temperature and at melting temperature you see that theta equal to theta E and this thermal energy, uh, uh, I mean, I mean difference in the, uh, in the depth of this well is exactly equal to zero. Okay, but as you increase the temperature, we see that it is basically the melt phase. So this is free energy corresponding to increasing temperature. And here we see that the melt phase becomes st more stable, whereas the solid phase become metastable because there is local minima corresponding to the higher temperature, but that local minima is no longer uh, 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 the stable equilibrium. This is the stable equilibrium is because this is a global minima. But as we decrease the temperature from the melting temperature, okay, we see that it is the solid phase which is more and more stable because this is the global minima and melt becomes local minima. So all these things are taken care of through this Gibbs free energy in the phase field model. Okay, and of course there are two extreme temperature. So this extreme temperature corresponds to the critical temperature for solid to melt transformation because at this temperature, you see that this depth height, uh, this well uh, depth, energy well depth is, it becomes zero. So if we have solid at this temperature okay it spontaneously becomes melt so this is critical temperature corresponding to the solid to melt transformation similarly this extreme curve extreme lower curve so here at this temperature if we have melt it spontaneously trans transforms to solid because this height uh, this well depth it curvature becomes zero at this at this particular temperature and these are the gibbs free energy corresponding to the temperature between these two extreme temperatures so uh, if we just consider Gibbs free energy of this kind, so all these essential pictures corresponding to the solid to melt transformation is captured through this. And this is of course corresponding to the homogeneous transformation from solid to melt or melt to solid. So this is uh, uh, the description that was given by Landau. Okay. Now we will uh, to describe the martensitic phase transformation and we should remember that the martensitic phase transformation is solid to solid transformation okay so there is no change in state of aggregation okay so martensitic phase transformation we recall that this is a solid to solid phase transformation where both the parent phase and the product phase they are solid and there is spontaneous deformation of the crystal lattice of the parent phase which is called austenite so we know we know from material science, for example, we talk about gamma gamma austenite. Okay, so uh, in steel, uh, we'll consider um, uh, some more simpler uh, materials uh, for uh, introducing this uh, model. So let us consider uh, there is uh, 
there is a material which is, I mean, uh, where there is something called martensitic phase transformation involved in shape memory alloys. So we know that there are uh, uh, different kind of shape memory alloys which are uh, which have very special property. I can show you one uh, video. So, So let me just share this. So can you see this video? Hello. Ah, uh, can you see this video? No, sir. The video is not on, not visible. Oh, video is not visible. Just please give me a moment. No, sir. Hello? Sir, uh, it is not uh, visible. Huh? Yes, sir. Now it is. Now it is visible. Okay. Okay. Yes. So here in this video, you can see. Okay. Spring is taken. And this is dipped in uh, hot water and it uh, regains its shape. Okay. Again, it is deformed. Okay. Deformed in some arbitrary shape. But if you put it in hot water you can see that it gains its uh, it remembers its shape and it regains its shape so this kind of material are called shape memory alloy where if you deform the if you deform the material to some arbitrary shape and then uh, uh, heat the material okay then you can see that it regains its shape it remembers its shape so these are called some shape memory alloy Okay, so it is a very complex process. So this is a thermomechanical process. You can see that deformation is involved as well as heating or uh, cooling down is also involved. So in this kind of uh, materials, I mean, this kind of response uh, uh, is due to the martensitic phase transformation. Okay, I'm not going to get into the detail of uh, working principle of shape memory alloy, but all I want to say that this kind of behavior of uh, such special behavior of shape memory alloy is due to this martensitic phase transformation. So now let us try to see what do you mean by martensitic transformation and how can we describe using the phase field theory uh, this kind of complex phenomena. Okay. Okay. And also we should remember, uh, I mean, here this is a austenite phase, which is the parent phase okay and here this austenite phase is let's say cubic austenite it's cubic crystal now if it is cooled down at certain temperatures we can see that this cubic austenite no longer remains cubic austenite and it spontaneously becomes some uh, uh, tetragonal uh, shape this is one of the examples well there are several examples of uh, martensitic phase transformation but this is the simplest example where we see that cubic austenite it transforms to tetragonal martensite Okay, so this is the unit cell where we see that all the sides are having equal length. Okay, this is unit cell. When it transforms to Martin side, we see that this side is elongated where C is greater than A. Okay, and two other sides are slightly contracted. Okay, and B, this length is B and B is less than A. Okay, uh, so this is austenite to martensitic transformation. Here, this phase is at having different crystal structure and this is called Martin side. And based on the symmetry of this transformation, there are three different uh, martensitic variants. These are called variants, although they look exactly the same, but they can have different orientation based on the symmetry. So these are three different possible unit cells that one can think of while uh, uh, there is martensitic transformation on this cubic austenite. Okay, and there are several examples, uh, several materials where this cubic to tetragonal transformation is observed. One is nickel aluminum alloy. There are several other pyroic materials also, which shows or exhibit this kind of transformation. Okay, there are several other kind of martensitic transformation, for example, cubic to orthorhombic transformation, cubic to monoclinic transformation. So all these are there. But let us try to understand how uh, we can model this using uh, uh, this transformation using uh, something called paste. Okay, and here one thing we should also remember that there is this transformation strain is involved. So here, of course, there is deformation which is involved here. Okay, because this unit cell, when it is elongated, 
then we get this in itself. And how this deformation is characterized? The deformation is characterized through something called bend tensors or bend uh, strain tensor or bend stretch tensor. Okay. So this is one linear operator. Okay. If we operate this on this, okay, uh, if we operate this operator on this unit cell, we get this unit cell. If, if we op operate this matrix on this unit cell, we get this unit cell. And we, if we operate this matrix on this unit cell, what we get is the third variant. So these are three different transformation matrices which are required to understand the transformation of this austenite into three martensitic variants. Okay, we'll be using these three matrices where alpha and beta are uh, some material constant. They are known from the unit cell, geometrically known. Where beta in this case is nothing but this length C divided by the original length A and alpha is nothing but B divided by the original length A. Okay, so these are three different constants which are uh, you can see that involved in this transformation matrices. Okay, and in martensity transformation, there is in thermomechanical properties. So the property, thermal and mechanical properties, for example, the stiffness, etc. The mechanical and thermal properties of this unit cell and this unit cell, they are different usually. So when there is continuous transformation from this uh, unit cell to this unit cell, there are discontinuities in the properties also involved here okay and this is non-diffusional phase transformation so there are atoms sitting over here so those atoms just move through a distance which is less than the unit cell parameters okay there is no long range atomic movement is involved in this martensitic phase transformation so this is also called non-diffusional or displacive phase transformation but there are diffusional phase transformation where uh, we can have long range atomistic diffusion and this is not of our interest now. Okay, this is all about martensitic in introduction to martensitic phase transformation. Now, how do we describe this martensitic phase transformation using something called phase spin model? Okay. The advantage of this phase spin model will become very clear uh, in the later slides, but let us try to first understand what we mean by this and how to use this models. Okay, so here, in earlier case, we had solid to melt transformation and only one order parameter was or one scalar parameter was sufficient to describe the order and disorder states and the continuous process of order to disorder transformation. But here, as you can see that there is austenite, this is one unit cell, okay, there are three different martensitic variants, those are three different phases, okay, although their chemical uh, or uh, lattice parameters are exactly similar. It is just symmetric transformation that is involved in these cases, but we need to have different order parameter for describing those phases here. So here, one order parameter is not sufficient to describe the uh, martensitic transformation. We need to have multiple order parameters. So here we consider four order parameters. Okay, so one order parameters which describe the austenite to martensitic transformation. Here is the austenite to martensitic transformation. Martensitic any transformation, austenite to any variant of martensite. This transformation is described by eta zero. And here we should remember that here austenite is basically high temperature phase, whereas martensite is having low, it's, it's a low temperature phase. We usually get martensitic variants at lower temperature. Now here austenite, this is very similar to the melt phase in solid to melt transformation because melt was a high temperature phase, whereas solid was low temperature phase. So here we draw the analogy that austenite is similar to the melt phase, okay, and martensite is similar to the solid phase. And here this is high temperature phase, this is low temperature phase. So high, so uh, austenite to martensitic transformation, we describe through a single order parameter eta zero. And to describe the uh, variant variant transformation, there is transformation which is possible from one variant to another variant. That is also possible here. Okay, so that also we need to take care of. And we take care of that aspect through three different order parameters. So three different order parameters, they describe the martensity variance. So we choose eta one to describe M1, where eta one equal to one, okay, when we are at M1 phase. And the other two order parameters are zero when we are at M1 phase. Similarly, for describing M2 phase, 
or m2 variant we consider eta 2 equal to 1 and eta 1 and eta 3 equal to 0 and similarly for describing m3 we consider eta 3 equal to 1 and two other other uh, two other parameters eta 1 and eta 2 are exactly equal to 0 okay so this is the description that we use and this is analogous to the uh, description that was given by landau which was for a different kind of phase transformation but we extrapolate that for describing martin stick phase transformation okay and here of course to control this variant variant transformation we need to have one constraint which is eta 1 plus eta 2 plus eta 3 equal to 1 okay so altogether we see that there are three independent order parameters although we have four order parameters but because of this constraint we have exactly three independent order parameters okay so here also we have uh, some free energy involved because it is uh, trans phase transformation is nothing but interplay of uh, free energy change in free energy because uh, system always try to uh, acquire its uh, lower free energy lowest free energy okay so that is the purpose of this phase transformation and here here also there is no exception uh, like uh, in solid to melt transformation we showed the free energy plot here also we can have the free energy plot okay so if we uh, look at the free energy plot we have exactly similar uh, features okay so austenite we consider eta 0 equal to 0 whereas eta 0 equal to 1 for martin city phase so this energy wells corresponding to the martin city phase and this is the energy well corresponding to the austenite phase and here also we have two critical temperatures we know from material science that there is critical temperature at which uh, the martin Martensitic phase is completely unstable and it spontaneously becomes uh, austenite at this high, high, higher temperature. Okay. Similarly, there is a low temperature, uh, extreme temperature at which the austenite phase is unstable and it spontaneously becomes martensite. But at intermediate temperature, we can have uh, two wells where one of the phases will be stable and the other phase will be metastable. Whereas, whereas exactly at the equilibrium temperature or thermodynamic, this is also called thermodynamic equilibrium temperature. And at this temperature, we have uh, equal depth of both the phases and both the phases can stay at equilibrium at this particular temperature because uh, of this. Uh, and But for transformation from one phase to one, another phase, we have to provide certain um, energy to cross this barrier. Okay. So this is... Uh, analogous to uh, analogous description of Landau theory for martin test. Okay, as I mentioned that in shape memory alloys uh, uh, and showed through that video that uh, this transformation uh, uh, is, uh, I mean, the special features of remembering the shape here, actually martin, martin City phase transformation is involved. Now, if you uh, consider or if you uh, take a sample from shape memory alloy and cut it and see uh, it under the microscope, you will see a very complex microstructure that uh, is that is evolved there. So if you, for example, consider nickel aluminium where I showed through example that austenite is uh, cubic and martensite is actually um, tetragonal phase, a tetragonal lattice. So if you just Take a section from nickel aluminum alloy and put it on, on you will see a very complex microstructure that is uh, developed inside the material. Okay, and if you and here you can see that this is 100 nanometers, and you see that there are several line like uh, microstructures. So these are all martensitic plates, these are martensitic plates. Okay, if you further zoom into this, so this is 100 nanometer, if you further zoom into this and come to this scale, you'll see that there are alternative martensitic plates. So this is one plate and see uh, in nickel, uh, in aluminum, the atomic size is uh, uh, very close to 0.3 uh, nanometer. And in, if this is 10 nanometer, so all these parts are actually close to these atoms. So they are uh, signifying the atoms basically. Okay. So and here you can see that there are alternative arrangements of martensitic plates. Okay. And uh, one can show using mechanics that this kind of microstructure actually minimizes the overall energy of the system. That is the reason that this kind of microstructures are evolved through 
uh, martensitic transformation in such materials. So this is called twin microstructure. Here, this one variant, this is one variant, this is another variant. We have seen that for this kind of material, we have three variants. Okay, so here one martensitic plate is in twin relationship with another martensitic plate. And also there is another plate, another plate. So this kind of complex microstructures are usually observed in shape memory alloys. So if you take another shape memory alloy, which is nitinol, which is widely used, for example, for straightening the teeth, we have seen that many people uh, have these wares, you know, uh, wounded around their teeth. So those are actually shape memory alloy, especially this nitinol alloy. Okay, uh, they have very special property and for that purpose only this uh, kind of uh, materials are used for straightening teeth. And also this kind of materials are used for other biomedical purposes. For example, uh, stains, stains that are used in opening the artery, blocked artery. So this kind of material, nitinol is used. And also they have very wide application in control systems, especially in actuators special in sp space application, they are widely used. So this shape memory alloys, they have very uh, wide range of applications in engineering and biomedical uh, regime. Okay, but uh, what is the reason for special behavior? So this kind of spatial microstructure, evolution of this kind of spatial microstructure is involved uh, in such spatial behavior. So that is the uh, thing I, that, that is the message that I wanted to convey here. Okay, so in, if we see that nitinol, and if we take a cross section of uh, deformed nitinol, we'll see that there are twins that are uh, developed here, and also there can be residual austenite. Austenite is let's say let's say is a high temperature phase. Okay, so it can be a very complex microstructure consisting of all the mixture of phases. Okay, all the mixture of phases. Similarly, uh, this is another uh, kind of microstructure. Uh, that that was that that was seen in this ferrous alloy okay and and this is you can see that there are hierarchy of microstructure hierarchy of plates okay similarly in copper nickel aluminum if you see sorry copper nickel aluminum there are also this kind of twin microstructure is uh, involved here and here you can see this is variant one and this is variant two and in this kind of phase transformation there are six variants that are involved in nickel uh, in nitinol there are 13 variants that are uh, possible it is based on the symmetry because those are more complex materials so uh, is it possible now the question arises that, that i mean do we have any tool through which we can study such kind of microstructure because such kind of microstructures gives very special properties mechanical and other electrical properties of the material so if we really want to understand the behavior of such material i mean uh, naturally the question arises is there any mathematical model that we can use for understanding and the answer is yes there is something called phase field model which is very uh, can which can be very conveniently used for modeling and simulation of such kind of behavior of such kind of materials under uh, thermal and mechanical loading and also other kind of loading for example magnetic loading so that is the purpose of this talk that uh, we want to see how to model such kind of microstructure evolution in shape memory alloys using something called phase field model. This slide I want to skip. Okay, now uh, to uh, show the importance of uh, martensitic phase transformation, I just want to take a few other examples which are very relevant for us mechanical engineering people. Uh, that uh, in carbon also we have this kind of martensitic transformation because we know that. Uh, carbon, uh, I mean, uh, carbon can exist either in graphite or in diamond phase. Okay, this is the phase diagram: pressure versus temperature. And we in diamond we have cubic structure, cubic. Uh, this is cubic crystal, and graphite is nothing but this hexagonal crystal. Okay, and uh, and and we should remember that this diamond is metastable at room temperature, whereas graphite is stable at room temperature. But but we can have diamond. Uh, we we can have diamond at room temperature because we we usually have various engineering applications, right? So diamond can actually exist at room temperature. But you should remember that it is graphite which is more stable at room temperature other than diamond. But since I already mentioned um, that there is energy barrier that is involved, so that prevents this diamond to transform continuously at room temperature 
otherwise uh, if this energy barrier was very low then uh, we could not have stable uh, diamond at room temperature but because of this high energy barrier uh, we can easily have diamond at room temperature but given a proper time let's say very long time this diamond will actually convert get converted to graphite because graphite is more stable i mean it's stable whereas diamond is metal stable so this is one example and diamond is very uh, important material for cutting tool materials right so there also we have this multi-density phase transformation and there are several processes for uh, synthesizing diamond from graphite using some kind of anvils okay this is one important study okay what is the importance of multi-density transformation to briefly uh, say that twinning and detwinning they play a very important role in exhibiting shape memory uh, effect in shape memory alloys uh, which are used in actuator dental braces and stains as i already mentioned and martin city transformation are involved in several in industrial important materials such as ferroic materials steel graphite to diamond transformation silicon this is one important material for electronic application silicon also undergoes martin city phase transformation and various specially synthesized alloys and why it is important because martin city transformation it uh, changes the uh, properties of the material so uh, we should be very careful while uh, using those material we should be uh, knowing what are the properties that are uh, evolving through this transformation okay and transformation induced plasticity it improves the mechanical properties of steel this is also very important phenomena that is uh, uh, important for steel research and also martin stick transformation it increase, inc increases the fracture toughness of material it is called transformation toughening okay now coming to this uh, phase field model for martin city transformation just before that uh, i mean we already saw that it is very important i mean uh, something called order parameters they play the central role but here we should also uh, uh, mention that when we when there is mixture of phases in phase field model so for example this red one is one phase and this blue one is another phase and we should we always we usually consider that these two phases are separated through a finite width region that is called interface. So here you can see that eta equal to one in this red region, whereas eta equal to zero in this blue region. So these two are different phases, whereas this eta is changing from zero to one uh, through this interface, okay? So uh, this finite width region of interface is, uh, is considered in this phase field model of Ginsburg land of time, okay? Because that, that simplifies our life otherwise there will be discontinuity in uh, various mechanical uh, i mean stresses or strains or displacements and that creates some complication in the computation so this is if you if we assume phase spin model of this kind where two phases are separated by a smoothly varying uh, a thin region of smoothly varying order parameter that is very computationally uh, friendly and this is also physical also because interfaces in phys physical sense are not exactly sharp. There is variation of properties or uh, crystal structure through uh, in, in the transition zone. And that is taken care of through this interface, okay? So here, let's say we have schematically, if we want to show this, we have phase one and phase two. There are sharp interface approaches, for example, something called level set method that is very popular for modeling sharp interface phenomena where they do not consider any width between two phases okay whereas uh, on the contrary here in multi-phase uh, in phase field model we'll assume that here we have exactly equal to zero order parameter zero in this blue region okay and here order parameter in the red region but there is a finite width region where the order parameter smoothly changes from zero to one okay and that region is basically interface okay so all we have seen that we have uh, scalar uh, scalar variables which describe the phases and we have to take care of the variation of uh, special variation of this order parameter to model the interfaces okay and also uh, we should have multiple wells so that we can have exactly exactly those many wells uh, as number of phases okay because those wells will designate or uh, characterize the uh, phases the phases number of phases that we have. So a phase field model uh, of Ginsburg lander type should consider internal variables called order parameter to describe the phases. 
interfaces should have finite width and their structure should be resolved. What do you mean by the structure should be resolved? The interface can have finite width of definite width and also they can have, they can possess certain energies, okay, which is uh, similar to the surface tension business, but uh, uh, in solid it is slightly more, okay. And the free energy model, the free energy will consider that should have multiple wells, okay, and evolution of order parameters, uh, they should be uh, quantified how how they how the evolution of order parameters that is transformation from one phase to another phase occurs that also should be quantified that is the purpose of this uh, inter exercise okay this already i mentioned that we consider for modeling matricidic phase transformation we consider one order parameter eta equal to eta zero which is zero in austenite and equal to one in martensite and also we need to have another n number of variables or n number of parameters to describe n number of martensitic variants and they should be uh, constrained through this uh, relation that summation of this eta i describing this order parameter of the variance equal to one this i already mentioned okay so this looks a bit complex and but we cannot uh, help here because martensitic transformation this itself is a very complex phenomena and here we should remember that this is uh, a thermomechanical process so here the thermal effect as well as mechanical stress effect of mechanical stresses and strains they have to be taken care of okay so here uh, like uh, plasticity but this is similar to plastic deformation okay uh, here we consider the total deformation gradient is decomposed in multiplicative multiplicatively decomposed into elastic part as well as transformation part this transformation part is very similar to the plastic uh, strain or plastic uh, deformation gradient corresponding to the plastic deformation okay so here we need to consider large deformation theory the reason is uh, this transformation strains i was uh, mentioning here okay so they are large strain they are usually large strain slide more more than 20 percent sometimes 50 percent okay this transformation strain so small strain theory cannot if you use small strain theory you will be losing a lot of information so it is ideal uh, it, it is usually uh, ideal to use the large strain theory that's why such complex uh, expression for the strains are uh, appearing here okay so here uh, this is uh, important uh, thing that we decompose the total deformation into elastic part into transformation part similar to the elastic plastic theory okay and we have this total strain which is nothing but f transpose a minus identity half of this and we have elastic strain defined in this manner and to model this entire complex phenomena this is the free energy that we have considered which involves this deformation gradient okay or eventually we will see that elastic strain it appears okay and the order parameters are involved it involves temperature as well as the gradient of this order parameter why gradient of this order parameter is needed because i already mentioned that here to model the interfaces this interfaces usually uh, uh, they, they vary specially uh, from one phase to another phase okay so there is a gradient that is involved here through this interface okay so to care to take care of that uh, interfacial energy we need to consider the gradient of this order parameter now the total energy it consists of the elastic energy or the strain energy it looks a bit complex because of this large uh, deformation theory okay elastic energy and we need to consider the barrier energy because i showed that there is barrier energy involved between two wells okay this barrier energy is required. and also there is thermal energy as uh, it is similar to the latent heat to take care of the latent heat part or heat of fusion part okay and uh, a special term is required here uh, which is called the penalty term i'm not going into details of this this is required from uh, the perspective that there should not be appearance of a third phase when there is transformation from one phase to another phase because here we we, we have n number of phases involved here n plus one number of phases because there is uh, one austenite and n number of martensitic variants. They are also treated as n phases. So austenite plus n number of martensitic variants altogether there are n plus one phases. So when we have this multi-phase theory, uh, this term is required. Okay, and here we have this interfacial energy 
which is function of the gradient of the order parameters. And here I have uh, shown the exact expression for the all, all these energies. Okay, the simplest version was uh, shown earlier while describing uh, solid to melt transformation. But these are uh, more complex because the phenomena itself is complex. Okay. So here we have this strain and quadratic in the total strain, elastic strain. Okay. Okay. And we have this barrier energy and we should consider the barrier energy between austenite and martensite as well as the barrier energy between all the martensitic variants. Okay. So here all n number of martensitic variants are also taken care of. And we have this thermal energy, and you should remember that there is thermal energy difference between austenite and martensitic phase. Between two martensitic variants, there is no difference in thermal energy. This is purely by deformation. Okay. So here we have this thermal energy, which involves only order parameter eta zero because it is there is thermal energy difference between austenite and martensitic phases only. This is the penalty term. Uh, let us not worry about this. And here is the interfacial energy. This is the interfacial energy that we consider for the austenite to martensite uh, interfacial energy between austenite and martensite. And this is the interfacial energy between martensitic variants. Okay. And since this is uh, 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 here at each and every point, all the properties they vary continuously. Okay. All the properties they vary continuously. Uh, we consider this kind of interpolation function for all the material properties, including the elastic properties and if there is any other properties, for example, thermal expansion coefficient, all the assume that this smoothly vary from one phase to another phase and that is described by this expression. <clears throat> okay, how much time I have? Hello. Hello, how much time I have? Yes, yeah, sir, you can continue for around uh, half an hour or 15 minutes. Okay, half an hour. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. Okay, so here uh, we have this uh, energy. So all the energies like here, the elastic energy, barrier energy, thermal energy, penalty term is, uh, is important, but here let us ignore that. And also the interfacial energy. So all these terms are very important for describing this. Uh, Martin's request transformation. Okay. And also here, one thing I should mention that uh, this, this is the interpolation function for interpolating the material properties. As I mentioned that all the properties, they vary continuously from one point to another point or one phase to another phase. Okay. And here, of course, there are interpolation functions that are involved. This is one interpolation function and this is another interpolation function. So they are, okay, they are given by this expression. Okay, now as I already mentioned that here this is a thermomechanical process. Okay, so how the rate of uh, transformation occurs, that means how this transformation from one phase to another phase occurs, it should also be described using thermodynamics there is thermodynamics involved here and uh, it cannot be any arbitrary equation uh, equation of evolution it has to be consistently derived through a thermodynamic consistent thermodynamic framework here also we have uh, derived the evolution law for this order parameters that means evolution law for these phases they are called the kinetic equation and that is also derived using uh, uh, all the laws of thermodynamics okay first law of thermodynamics second law of thermodynamics is also involved here i didn't show the derivation enter derivation here but uh, if you believe me then i i would like to say that uh, since second law of thermodynamics it gives us inequality right it cannot tell us uh, in which direction the process should occur but it should all i mean it should tell us that what are the criteria what is the inequality that should be satisfied through a process a process to be viable okay so using the second law first law and second law of thermodynamics we arrive to this something called dissipation inequality okay so here this is the dissipation inequality corresponding to the order parameter eta zero and please recall that eta zero is uh, order parameter describing austenite to martensite transformation okay whereas this is the inequality dissipation inequality that we get for evolution of the order parameters corresponding to the variance and since there are n number of variants, so we have n number of terms which are 
uh, summed up. Okay, so these are the two inequalities that we uh, arrive to using our thermodynamic consistent framework, where we use the thermodynamic laws, for example, first law and second law of thermodynamics. And also, uh, since here forces are involved, we have to use the mechanical equilibrium equation, which is balance of linear momentum. Okay, so this is one of the inequalities. This is one of the inequalities. And from this inequality, what we postulate, we write the ginzburg lander equation, which is the kinetic equation for order parameter eta zero. And we assume that eta zero is proportional to the driving force. So this is uh, in, in any chemical reaction, you will have this kind of uh, equation where you have this uh, flux term. This is like flux term and this is like force term. Like so, this is not exactly the force, but this is called the thermodynamic driving force for driving this order parameter evolution of this order parameter. In fluid mechanics, also we have the strain rate times uh, shear stress, for example, uh, in viscous fluid. Okay, so the strain rate is similar to the flux term, whereas the shear stress is similar to the force term. Here also, this is rate rate process. So here we have this rate conjugate with driving force. Similarly, here also we have the rate of this evolution of the order parameters corresponding to the variant. And here we have conjugate driving force. Everywhere in any chemical reaction, we have such kind of uh, conjugate uh, pair that appears in the inequalities, dissipation inequalities. And here also no exception. And from uh, this inequality, we postulate that this rate of uh, rate term is proportional to the flux term and there is a proportionality constant which is called the mobility or uh, kinetic coefficient of this uh, reaction process okay this is nothing but reaction okay and from here also we uh, consider that eta i dot for each of the variants the rate its rate is equal to summation of l i j l i j is the kinetic coefficient between variant i and j times this conjugate force okay okay there is a derivation involved here which is uh, there in our uh, one of the papers but uh, i didn't show the derivation i i'm just showing the final equation so here we have uh, rate equation for all the order parameters okay? all n plus one order parameters where one of the conjugate force i have shown here it, it's very complex because of complex energy okay uh, this is x0 is nothing but this expression and how do we get this expression this expression we get by taking the variational derivative of this total free energy this is nothing this is exactly equal to the variational derivative not the usual derivative but the variational derivative of this total free energy this driving force x0 okay uh, there are competition that is involved here but uh, this is the entire picture this is the main picture that how how the order parameters how the phases will evolve how to uh, quantify that these are the equation that will tell us how all the phases will evolve from one state to another state one thermodynamic state to another state through this process okay okay and of course here since traces are also involved uh, of course uh, from solid mechanics uh, like we usually do that we use the balance of linear momentum and get the equilibrium equation which says that divergence of total stress is zero since here we have used large deformation theory so there are several stress measures that are possible in large deformation theory and one of the stress is first piala kirchhoff stress okay and uh, equilibrium equation says that this divergence of the p is equal to zero in the entire domain or you can equivalently write that divergences, divergence of the Cauchy stress equal to zero. Okay, so this is our system of equation that we need to solve to, uh, uh, to understand the evolution of the phase transformation. Okay, so this was obtained using mechanical equilibrium equation or balance of linear momentum. This is stress equilibrium equation and we have uh, <coughs> internal variables which are the order parameters the evolution of order parameters are governed by this relation. This is similar to the heat conduction equation, very similar to the heat conduction equation. See, <coughs> nonlinear heat conduction equation. In heat conduction equation, we have the temperature dot equal to some coefficient times uh, heat generation term plus Laplacian of uh, 
the heat okay here also we have the similar terms so here uh, it's like rate equal to this is x0 this is x0 so here up to this term this is like non-linear heat generation term and the last term is similar to the laplacian term here it is more complex because of the uh, complex deformation okay this is like laplacian term and this is like non-linear heat generation term so this is exactly similar to the heat conduction equation of course here uh, it's non-linear heat conduction equation and uh, we have many other things involved here so this is the system of equation that we need to solve to understand this uh, process okay and of course here uh, like uh, in heat conduction equation we have fourier's law which uh, designate the boundary condition for the uh, heat i mean uh, neumann boundary condition for the heat or we have dirichlet boundary condition of the heat <coughs> excuse me <coughs> So boundary condition and initial condition for the uh, temperature terms are needed to solve the heat conduction equation. Here also, we need to have boundary condition for the order parameters and initial condition for the order parameters. Okay, we will discuss those uh, exact initial and boundary condition we have taken uh, through the examples. Okay. So all, all I wanted to say that now we have boiled down our theory uh, in solving this set of equations. Of course, this is partial differential equation. This is also partial differential equation. And here we will use, let's say, finite element method. Any other methods, for example, spectral method also one can use, but uh, I have used finite element method for solving this equation. And let us try to understand the microstructure. Okay, so this is uh, uh, one of the first examples that I want to show. So I just considered a 2D example so far. Okay. So let us consider one 2D sample, and this is all, all these are single crystals. The examples I'll give you are basically single crystal material. If it is polycrystalline material, there are few other things that need to be taken care of because uh, uh, heterogeneity through the grain boundaries. So that aspect we will not discuss here. Okay, so let us first consider this sample, which is 2D sample, a uh, squared sample. Okay. Uh, and here we'll consider nickel aluminum alloy order uh, material parameters, which shows cubic to tetragonal phase transformation. And I already showed that these are the transformation strains uh, corresponding to the cubic to tetragonal trans transformation, where we have diagonal elements along the transformation matrices. Okay. These are some material parameters that I have taken from the literature. Okay. Uh, now let us try to see what how the microstructures evolves. So this is the initial uh, sample that we have considered where we have random distribution of the order parameter eta zero. This is the initial condition and we apply, you know, uh, forces. We apply uh, displacements here at these two surfaces. At these two surfaces, we apply displacements such that the strain is basically 6% uh, at each phase. So this epsilon 2 bar is 6%. Okay. And two other surface, uh, surfaces are roller supported. Okay, there is no movement in this direction or no movement in this direction. Okay, if you just consider such kind of boundary condition uh, and let the system evolve. So this was our initial condition and we uh, solved it over uh, uh, a time period such that we get the stationary solution or steady state solution. So this is our steady state solution that we get. And here we can see that a complex microstructure has evolved. So this is uh, one martensitic plate. And here you remember that in 2D example, we have just assumed two martensitic uh, variants. So this is this dark red is one of the martensitic variants and this dark blue is another martensitic variants. And there is an interface between these two variants. Okay? So here you can see complex microstructures that has evolved to this uh, by solving this equation. Okay, so here is another example I want you to show where I have considered 30 nanometer by 30 nanometer sample and this is subjected to 2% biaxial strain. Okay, so uh, here you can see that a very uh, uh, complex structure, microstructure, these are martensitic plates. These are plates of variants. This is variant one, this red one, and this blue one is variant two. So you can see that alternative martensitic plates are appearing. This blue one is martensitic plate two, 
red one is one two one two like this okay and you can see that this is very uh, uh, qualitatively very similar to this microstructure that was observed experimentally okay okay now we have seen such kind of twin microstructure so is it uh, our model can uh, our phase twin model can uh, predict such kind of microstructure and we can see through this example yes it can produce okay so we consider one uh, two dimensional uh, sample where we apply 10% strain in this direction and we see that uh, i mean of course the initial condition here is random distribution of order parameters and you can see that this variance this kind of plates are appearing this kind of plates are appearing so you see that there is one plate there is another plate martensitic variant plate the blue one is variant 2 red one is variant 1 and in practice we also see such kind of plates okay such kind of things where the twin plate size you can see of the order of uh, some 2 3 nanometers or 4 5 nanometers at max okay and here also we see that these plates are of this of, 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 of similar sizes okay so this is qualitative comparison of course here quantitative comparison is very difficult because here uh, we still don't know under what thermomechanical condition processes this kind of microstructures evolved here and also in realistic material we have uh, usually polycrystalline material but here i have considered single crystal but still we see that uh, the result that we get using our phase spin model are qualitatively similar to what is observed in experiment or practice okay and here we consider some very special kind of uh, deformation or boundary condition to get such kind of twin microstructures so here also we see that this uh, twin microstructures have appeared so this red one is variant one and this blue one is variant two and this is with different sample size okay of course here we see that there is a sample size effect which is involved here of course in polycrystalline materials also we can have different grain size so here each sample is nothing but a single grain in polycrystalline material we can have varying grain size so what would be the effect of those varying grain size in polycrystalline material on twin microstructure that also uh, one can uh, just predict from uh, this results so here this is smallest size then we gradually increase the sample size and see that of course uh, twin plates size also increases okay and these plants are basically invariant plants okay so different uh, model for the transformation stages we considered and uh, we got different kind of solution qualitatively similar but uh, quantitatively different solution for uh, and this is with example of copper nickel aluminum which involves cubic so earlier examples were with nickel aluminum where austenite phase was cubic austenite and martensitic phase was uh, tetragonal uh, phase okay and we can uh, use the same model to predict the twin microstructure in different other material for example nickel copper nickel aluminum where austenite is cubic austenite whereas the martensitic phase is orthorhombic phase and we still can get uh, reasonable uh, twin microstructure using our model okay in nitinol which is widely used there also uh, it is uh, cubic to monoclinic transformation where there are 13 variants okay uh, there also we can have qualitatively similar twin microstructure okay. so this shows that the model that we have uh, developed it's, it's it's able to predict the microstructures quality of course this model has to be uh, further uh, utilized for uh, getting more practical complex microstructures and to understand and and this model can be used uh, for understanding other kind of phase transformation for example uh, in graphite diamond transformation or in silicon also there are several complex or very interesting phenomena that are uh, observed through experiment but uh, this model whether uh, that can be used or this model can be used for predicting those kind of interesting phenomena is also a further scope uh, that we have to explore okay so this is uh, and of course here i just wanted to show another example where we considered one sample and this was under indentation load okay there was some indentation displacement that we have applied 
and initially it was in austenite phase okay and we see that with time there are microstructures that evolve in this case also okay so this is because of this indentation there are uh, several experimental results where uh, microstructure evolution under indentation in such kind of material is uh, has been observed in experiments okay so that also can be uh, predicted through uh, our phase field model so we our conclusion is that okay uh, to understand or to model microstructures evolution under martin stick transformation is there any uh, mathematical model that can be used yes there is, there are uh, the space field models that can be efficiently used for predicting the microstructure evolution and also predicting evolution of the properties that also can be studied using this model and uh, some other uh, criticality if there is involved in such kind of transformation martin stick transformation that also can be observed through this and uh, i should mention that uh, uh, a group has recently uh, used this model for stu studying the phase transformation in silicon okay and they have observed several uh, complex thing several critical uh, aspects of uh, transformation in silicon so that was the idea of uh developing or purpose of developing this multiple space field model for studying martin stick transformation that that's all and uh, if there is any question i'll be happy uh, thank you sir hello yeah yeah i can hear yeah, yeah thank you sir uh, so it was very very nice session uh, all the theoretical as well as practical as well as mathematical aspect was covered very beautiful in this lecture and uh, uh, can, can can we ask the audience for some questions sir? yeah yeah sure sure so do anyone have have any question i saw hands raised earlier during the lecture so i thought there might be a few questions hello uh, yeah yeah I, I can hear you of course i'm asking uh, uh, i'm asking to the audience is okay. there any questions? No one is uh, Hello? Yeah, yeah, yes, I can. Yeah. Uh, earlier I saw a few hands, but nobody is respond responding to so. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, hello, uh, nice lecture. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah I can hear you. Okay, I'm Sir, A.K. Nath from uh, IIT Kharagpur. I am yes, the sir. next speaker. So I have got to one uh, uh, question. Uh, can I ask? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, we are working on laser shock pinning uh, of uh, uh, different materials like uh, titanium uh, and uh, stainless steel. And there also we see that after uh, laser shock pinning, which introduces good amount of compressive stresses, we see the twinning uh, effect, the formation of twinning, uh, which results in improvement of micro hardness as as well as uh, fatigue uh, life of the uh, component, particularly when we do the welding. So, uh, like a study with your model, the laser shopping which you, we try to introduce compressive stresses yes sir it will be it will be uh, uh, you can easily use this model but here uh, you know uh, uh, of course here uh, i mean it uh, uh, you have to have some computational uh, model for this and uh, there are several uh, you can you can of course use this model uh, and you have to take care of the computational aspect because here here the thing is that this is nanoscale approach okay uh, and to uh, model this in a very large scale sample it will it you might have difficulty uh, i am not able to hear uh, uh, it is coming uh, slightly disrupted yeah okay can you hear me sir now hello hello yeah sir? can you hear me sir not sir I think we uh, can't hear this. Again. Okay. 
hello ekinath sir hello uh, hey. hello sir hello Uh, sir, can you please reconnect so that uh, you can? Uh, there might be some technical problems. Hello. Yeah. Sir, yeah. Please reconnect yourself again so that. Uh... Okay, I'll reconnect again. Okay, sir. Okay. Um, hello. Uh, meanwhile, uh, for the uh, participants, I have shared a feedback form for this session. So you all can fill this form while Basanti ma'am will introduce our next speaker. Uh, sir. Uh, uh, Ankur sir. Yeah, yeah, ma'am. Uh, we heard it. So we will wait for him. Meanwhile, I've shared uh, the form, and other, others can uh, fill the feedback form. Uh, yes. Uh, Basak, sir. Yes, yes, I'm here. Uh, sir, uh, sir, we'll be connecting in a while. Uh, sure. Okay. So sorry for the inconvenience. Sure, no uh, problem. Yeah, I understand. Thank you, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Yeah, uh, I can hear. Uh, no, no, sir. Actually, I am talking. I, I try to talk with uh, uh, Ekinas, sir. Okay, sure. Yeah. Hello, hello. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Yeah, sir. Now I can answer to your question. Yes, this model can be used for uh, modeling, twinning uh, of uh, whatever you were saying. Uh, yeah, of course, here also uh, we have uh, applied tensile stresses, but it can be, uh, I mean, one can use uh, compressive stress as well. And here I have shown all the simulation result in two dimension, but one can easily extend it for three dimension. But in three dimension, if you want to solve, you might, you might need to uh, have uh, uh, this parallel computation facility. I see. Okay. That will involve. Okay, several... I'll communicate with you uh, later yeah. on uh, and see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll be nice. very happy. Okay. Sir. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. It was a nice talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for, for the lecture. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay. So now uh, I would uh, I would pass to Kanti ma'am, and she will introduce our next speaker. And then we'll start our next session.